The Granite Trail takes in three quarries. The Granivere, Millstone Mountain and Thomas's Quarry, which is the one you see from Newcastle. They're all on the Granite Trail. Now here we are just above Newcastle Harbour. This harbour was built by Lord Ansley around 1830, 1840, along with Lord Kilmory who built one at Analong, to take advantage of the high demand, commercial demand for cut stone for roadways, uh, curb stones and buildings and the, this material was being exported using wind power schooners from the, the two harbours, Analong and Newcastle. Newcastle is just below us here, now full of pleasure boats. At the time the, the harbours were built there was a huge demand for material, granite material for roadways because the Industrial Revolution was changing the nature of where people lived. Belfast was a growing city, Liverpool was a growing city, Manchester was a growing city and so from middle of the 19th century to well into the 20th century, 1920, 1930, there was a huge demand for this sort of material. There's some fascinating tales to be revealed up here about a people, I suppose mainly men, you know, over several centuries, you know, worked their guts out on these mountainsides and the evidence of that work is here and that's what the granite trails and the quarries that people will be led to is about. It's about uh, a window, a looking glass, back on those amazing peoples who toiled and troubled and made these very hard livings on this mountainside. All that is for the exploring, really. The Granite Trail starts at the harbour here behind me, Newcastle Harbour. It follows the line of the Bogey Trail, which was a, a, a punkular railway which ran to the quarry. This line here would have been a, a railway line in essence, a small railway line, and I ended up at the quarry. All the stone in the area, been cut and dressed, would have been brought to, to the railhead, up at the hill above us, and then down the slope, down the, the bogey trail, ending up at the harbour, would have been directly shipped uh, into the schooner's way time. Uh, when you come about 30 steps up the granite trail, you'll come across a, a bogey. Uh, this is a replica bogey of the bogies were used to transport granite, mostly square sets. These are square paving stones which were intended for the streets of all the big industrial cities, mostly on the west coast of England, Liverpool, Manchester, Bristol and even as far as Glasgow. The stone was cut really so that it, it had a, a useful life. It was four by four and sometimes by eight and that apparently fitted neatly inside the, the frog of a horse's hoof. Actually the space within the horseshoe to give the horse a grip but with metal shoes it would polish and become quite slippery so you could turn it one face at a time and keep revealing fresh faces. These bogies were powered by gravity in other words the heavy bogey at the top outweighed the empty bogey at the bottom and when they were released the heavy one going down the line could pull a, a cable way and bring the, the empty bogies back up without any energy required. It's possible the last bogey truck to use this railway system was, was in the 1920s. As you go up the trail, you'll also see a replica of a slipe. This was typical of the, the, the man-made slipe, so it would have been man-hauled or hauled by ponies, heavy ponies. All stone would have been drawn by a slipe because there was no advantage of gravity to go across the slope. At the top of the, of the bogey trail, you'll find a reconstructed replica shoddy, and this would have been a shelter for workmen overnight and possibly you can guess on a wild wet stormy night having worked all day you didn't want to face a journey home so these were for their own comfort and security at night time. This part of the granite trail from the harbour reaches I suppose the open mountainside you'd describe it it leaves the forest and it's at that point when you've got this wonderful mountain above you to the right and the left the locals would call these the Purple Mountains and they live up to that description, that term, you know, in the summer months and the early autumn months when they go ablaze with the purple of the heathers. I mean, just one type of flower is indicative of the quality of this landscape, you know, very extensive heath land, which is what these mountains are about. Well, here we're at Drenover Quarry. This is a quarry based on a small outcrop of rock just behind me, as you'll see these lines in the rock, these joints, and this has been cut, as you can see, almost like going up steps in layers. And on each of these faces, you'll see the, the evidence of the plug marks. Most of this quarry was cut of plug and feathers. And so we have here, actually, beside me, a piece that's been cut using the method of plug and feathers. Basically, what you had was a sharp point, a piece of round section metal coming to a hardened point. You used it to drill by just hammering it a hole into the 
the actual base. And then into that you would have placed two slips of metal, half section, half round section, and in the, between those two you placed a plug. And the importance of the plug and feather method was you, you created an even stress right across the stone. And to do that you had to each, hit each one of these plugs in turn. And you had to hit them such so that you were not over hitting anyone. If you over hit anyone very often the line of break would run off at an angle. The stone nations will tell you that you had to know the reed of the stone. R-E-D-E, and that reed is equivalent to, is equivalent to uh, the grain of, of wood. So a, a stone man would have been able to tell you how the crystal form was lying and how it would crack. Occasionally the stone resisted the stress and you can find the plug and feathers left because there was no way of like, abstracting them. If the stone didn't split, you couldn't retrieve them. And you can find, even in this, on a face over here, now rusting away, the plug and feather still embedded in the rock. But this, this would have been piecework. The men working here would have been working and only paid by the work they produced, not by the time they spent. And you would have had maybe a family group here or uncles and cousins or brothers working together. And throughout more, and these are very often just known as the workings. Um, this is a relatively small quarry. And right round the, the moorings, you'll find remnants of little quarries like this. The Mourn granites are known for their, their crystal structure. This stone would be referred to as a salt and pepper granite. If you can imagine the white grains of salt and the black grains of black pepper are shaken onto a white plate. The crystals, black crystals of mica, the white crystals of feldspar, and then dotted among them, glintine, you would have quartz crystals. So those are the three components, but it's been known by the stone men as pepper and salt granite. When you're at the Drinivar quarry on the, the, the granite trail, if you pause for a moment and look to the south, you'll see behind you here a pile of cut and dressed curb stones. These are, were all ready for delivery, but the trade collapsed and they're just abandoned there. It's worth the walk over to see the neat trimmed cut curb stones. These had, were known in Belfast as Kirby's, around the morn as Cribbon, and in various places just as Curbs. And, uh, some people spell it K-A-R-B and some C-U-R-B, but they're curved stones. While you're on the granite trail, you'll be near millstone quarry, but the quarry was not used for production of millstones. They were cut from what's sometimes known as freestone on the mountain, just immediately above the quarry. At one time, there were 600 cereal mills working throughout Ulster, and they had to get their millstone somewhere, and it's likely that quite a significant number were cut in the moors and possibly in an area known as millstone mountain. Analong Mill especially had a number of millstones from this area. Thomas Quarry is, is the one big quarry that's still in use, and you can see it clearly from Newcastle, and it is part of the Granite Trail, a very important part because that is the last truly working quarry in Mourne. Stone from it has travelled all over, and in fact, one of the largest complete pieces of granite ever cut was cutting it for a millennium stone for Delamont Country Park. I believe it's nearly 30 foot long and it's cut in one piece. And it was first cut using plug and feathers because they couldn't risk a big stone like that being damaged by blasting. As you go around the granite trail, nearly every quarry site you come to, you'll find near that quarry site remnants of some sort of a building. Now these can be of two types, simple shelter for bad weather where you use the rubble and the cut stone to make a building. It would have been roofed with corrugated iron or light timber. But some of them had a specialist function. They were known as smithies or smithies locally. And these, these would have been blacksmith shops. And each man working in the, 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 the quarry would have been responsible for preparing his own tools because there was a, a risk if you over hardened a chisel and as you struck it with a hammer, if it splintered, that splinter of steel could enter your eye. And there are quite a, a number of, of stone men who'd want an eye. We have a long history since we acquired this part of the mountain in 1992 of trying to facilitate access without spoiling the environment, of course. There's a great balance to be struck there in terms of what we do to invite people to recreate and enjoy these wonderful places. That balance is also about not trying to, you know, industrialise and, and sort of, I suppose, over-exploit in a way these wonderfully wild places. We've engaged in part two of this granite trail building, this granite trail project, 
Part one got us into the, the two quarries of Thomas's and the millstone, and I suppose a small circular walk associated with that back into the forest. Part two, as it were, extends that, and it's, it's a great extension. It takes us to a third quarry, adds another quarry to the trail, the quarry known as Dinovar. So it extends the route, extends the walk, extends the experience, and enables an even you know, an add-on, another circular walk back through another part of the forest. So, you know, it's a great development of the trail. You don't have to get to a mountain top to enjoy this trail. It's at fairly low level, and we like that because it gives people an opportunity who perhaps aren't quite mountain fit, as it were, to enjoy these lower slopes. <laughs>